All right, so I just want to have a few opening remarks. I just want to think a little bit, um, reaching that stage in my career where I can look back and ask, you know, what questions we've addressed uh, successfully and haven't uh, addressed successfully. So I just want to look a little bit, spend a little time looking at that. And in terms of problems, um, I think uh, there's been a number of problems over the years that uh, still are with us. And though I would list those as the problems of initial conditions, the problem of the central engine, the problem of putting together the history of mass loss to build a model. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the physics, the prime problem of binaries and also of magnetic fields. And when I look back, um, I'm going to be looking back from this paper that Bruce Ballack and I wrote an annual reviews on Planetary Nebula in 2002. So it's almost 20 years old. Um, so I'll just be using that kind of as reference. So when it comes to the problem of initial conditions and of the central engine, the problem is really uh, one of an abundance of possibilities. So this is from that paper, that annual reviews paper. And as you can see, um, here are six different possible scenarios for um, generating uh, planetary nebula. Or there's four different scenarios with two different kinds of central engines. So um, in the upper left here, we have the standard, what we would used to call the, the general interacting stellar wind model, where you've got a, a, a toroidal density distribution and a fast wind blowing into it. Um, here, we've got a version of that where you've got magnetized winds uh, uh -oh. and the, magneti the magnetization of the wind changes considerably. Uh, the evolution. And then we've got, I think we need to turn off, is that up to me or? Yeah, people could mute there. Uh, and so then um, there's also the possibility of multipolar flows for whatever reason. And then also of um, uh, 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 a point symmetry from rotating collimated flows. And then in terms of the central engine where things are actually um, uh, being driven, uh, you can either have common envelope evolution from binaries or um, you could have a, a disc forming around the secondary. So uh, it's a lot of choices. And how do we link a particular uh, PNE to a particular uh, one of these choices? Now, the problem of history is always making that link. Actually, for a specific object, how well can we link an observation to a specific observation to a specific model nebula? And this goes, this is from the paper, and it goes way back. This was a work that Harold Melema and I did, um, where, you know, there was an object, we ran a model, we made a synthetic observation, um, and, you know, came out, it came out okay. Now we're at the point, this is a, a success we have to point out, um, this is this remarkable model made of uh, the cat's eye done by a high school student using shape, right? Um, so this is pretty incredible. Ran the hydro model in shape and then used shape. So this is really an indication of how far we've come from that first work that uh, Harold and I did with uh, Bruce Ballack and Vincent Ica as our, 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 uh, our guides. Um, so this sort of shows you how far we have come. But then the problem is always, you know, weather versus climate. What about degeneracies? If we make a specific model for a specific uh, plant, uh, object, you know, is it possible that you could have made it using other things? Hydro versus MHD, using a collimated jet versus just a wide angle wind, radiation effects, um, uh, a common envelope evolution with two stars versus a common envelope evolution with maybe multiple planets. Uh, and then there's the problem of binaries, right? And particularly disks. Right, we have where, where and when are we gonna invoke a disc to drive our planetary nebula? Discs can form around the primary, they can form around the secondary, they can form during or before common envelope evolution, they can form during con common envelope evolution, and they can form entirely without common envelope evolution. So uh, without common envelope evolution, this goes all the way back to Master Demos and Morris, just you get um, uh, either, uh, 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 Bondi Hoyle uh, accretion or wind Roche lobe uh, 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 accretion or Roche lobe accretion. So here are these different examples of work: Reichardt, McLeo, Zhu, all modern simulations that track the formation of disks. And you can get it occurring in many different places. And how are we to know which one of those cases uh, obtains? So that's my little symbol for not knowing what we're supposed to do. Uh, and then there's the problem of magnetic fields, which you know we believe are going to play a strong role. And we've seen some really 
great both models and observations give us indications of this. And going back to our paper, this is um, uh, Guillermo's work from 1999. And we just saw uh, an example of, you know, he's continuing that work and showing how much magnetic fields can do in terms of shaping. But again, fields can form from the star or stars. They can form from disks around the stars. You can get fields that are dominated by poloidal fields, which are, um, if it's in a disk, uh, that would be a, what we call the fling dominated model, or it can be dominated by B5, which are um, uh, magnetic tower or spring dominated models. So there's lots of questions about which ones we should choose for an individual object. And then just to conclude, um, so there are all of these questions, but but and I, but I, as I pointed out, we've made lots of progress. There's one place I wanted to point out that just was really satisfying to my soul. So you know, back early on, um, uh, uh, Soker and Livio and Morris, all the way back in the '80s, were pointing out how to link the central engine to the nebula, particularly with things with disks, etc. And now recently, you know, this work of making uh, there's this young graduate student named Bruce Ballack who's been running lots of models using AstroBear, who's also really been trying to point Point, you know, to the specific links between um, uh, models and observations. But there's just one thing that in doing that and in looking for new physical processes, I just wanted to point out. So way back in 1992, uh, Vincent was running, you know, his code and found a really interesting way of collimating outflows by uh, what he called inertial confinement. And this is a paper that we did on this, um, uh, where basically the shape of the shock, the inner shock here, so this is the a nebula, that's an outer shock, the contact discontinuity, the inner shock. Um, the inner shock would get elliptical, and because of its ellipticity, it could drive a, a jet inside the hot bubble. And so in models that we did of common envelope-based shaping, where a common envelope model done by Orsula's group was used as input for driving a spherical wind from the center there, we found we could do a very nice job of producing highly uh, bipolar lobes. But the important, now, you know, as has been brought up, there's the role of cooling that we need to understand. But one of the most beautiful things that we found deep, because this was adaptive mesh refinement, we could have very, very high resolution at the central regions. And what we found hiding in there, there's the central star, and hiding in there is this beautiful elliptical shock. It's a lens-shaped shock that is doing all of the collimation that is producing this jet here. Um, and I just found that, you know, this is the progress that really shows what the technology, both numerical and um, uh, you know, computer technology has allowed. Because this is exactly what Vincent was talking about. We're able to produce a highly uh, uh, lens-shaped shock, which does all the collimation to make this jet so highly collimated. So I just want to close with this idea that um, uh, Albert brought up, which is quite good. We don't need new physics. We, we, we have the physics that we need. We just don't need when to deploy it. And so I'm sort of interested in we as we look at these hydro models to sort of ask this question, uh, you know, do we have the right physics? Are we deploying the right physics for that specific model? And how do we talk about climate? How do we talk about generalities? Okay, so I managed to get that done in eight minutes. And so then I will turn it over. Um, and the, uh, I have to get my schedule here. <laughs>